And we are live. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will be discussing recent news events about PayPal getting ready to launch a platform that will allow you to buy and sell various cryptocurrencies. Now, what I find ironic and funny about this is just two years ago, PayPal's former CEO, Bill Harris, referred to Bitcoin and various cryptocurrency projects as being pump and dump schemes and referred to Bitcoin as a flat out scam. Yet this same platform, the same company that he worked for is about to launch a crypto platform. I have been involved in this space for well over seven years. I have seen so many people from the legacy financial system come out and call Bitcoin and various other crypto projects scams. And then you find out that these same companies or banks or institutions who are critiquing and criticizing Bitcoin, then you find out years later they're involved in it. And this is why I stress and I emphasize to you that it's important that you go out and always do your own due diligence and understand that no one is going to look after your financial well-being better than you will. Same thing happened with JP Morgan. The, Jamie Dimon referred to Bitcoin as being a scam. And then we find out that JP Morgan's working with Coinbase and helping them facilitate their banking accounts. At a certain point, you have to understand that, you know, don't always watch what the left hand is doing because there's also another hand and that's the right hand. So you have to make sure that you are always paying attention. And then now PayPal is out and they're trying to hire people in the blockchain space. And that goes back to why I keep stressing for you to get involved in the industry from an entrepreneurial standpoint and also from an employment standpoint, because less than 1% of the world's population owns cryptocurrency and even a smaller percentage of the world's population actually even knows anything about the technical aspects about blockchain technology, about cryptography. And if you spend the next three, six months, nine months, a year of your life acquiring these skills, you're going to be able to go out here and build different dApps on top of the Ethereum blockchain utilizing Solidity. Uh, you see DeFi is on fire right now. You're going to be able to go out here and get employed by companies like a JP Morgan, like a PayPal, who need people who understand this technology because many people from the legacy financial system, they don't have the necessary technical skills to be able to really even understand what this technology is going to bring to you. And if you go on LinkedIn and I'll pull the article up later, blockchain is one of the most searched and profitable industries to be going into even for entry level employees. So as you come into the live stream, please like this video, share this video. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Make sure that you hit the notification bell. For those of you who are interested in getting involved in the cryptocurrency blockchain space, I've launched my tech Academy. We have a free seven day trial where we'll teach you all of the fundamentals and foundations about how to buy Bitcoin, how to sell Bitcoin, and basically how cryptography in general works. We also have a coding bootcamp that will be starting on the 12th of January, I mean of July. Simply come down here and all of the information that you need to know about my tech academy will be in here. And as I stated before, we have a free seven day trial. Also, if you want to contact me, my Instagram is in the description below. Simply click the link, follow me on Instagram and shoot me a DM. And if you can see me and hear me, well, you can't see me, but if you can see the screen clearly, and if you can hear me, please type one and then we'll get the stream started. <clears throat> Good. Okay. So everyone's type one. So, so I'm going to play this audio for you real quick. And then we're going to get to the PayPal article. Give me one second. <clears throat> okay. 
Bitcoin futures may be booming, but our next guest says that uh, it is a scam. In an op-ed for Recode this week, former PayPal CEO Bill Harris called the cryptocurrency, quote, the greatest scam in history, noting that it is a pump and dump scheme unlike anything the world has ever seen. How does he really feel? Bill Harris joins us now from San Francisco to stand by these claims. Bill, great to have you with us. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, you know, reading through this op-ed, it's sort of the, the bear case, the critics case that has been put forth for a long time. It's a, not accepted as a means of payment. There's no store value because of the volatility in price. It has no intrinsic value. Is it possible, though, Bill, that perhaps Bitcoin has not yet found its use as a cryptocurrency yet, and that we're looking at the United States where there are numerous ways of digital payment and, and the use of dollars is is reliable and good, and we're not looking at other markets that need an alternative currency such as the emerging markets. Well, sure, but even in emerging markets, um, might as well use dollars, euros, or existing currencies um, if the local currency is uh, subject to hyperinflation. You are out there in Silicon Valley, and you, you probably hear a lot of the venture capitalists expound on the virtues of Bitcoin and blockchain, et cetera. Is there anything about yes. this that you think is not a scam, or do you think that everybody just sort of drinking the Kool-Aid? Well, yeah, so there's a lot that's not a scam, but yes, everyone's drinking the Kool-Aid. I think, you know, just a couple of days ago, somebody relatively prominent said, uh, Bitcoin is bigger than the internet, bigger than the industrial revolution. Was Seriously. that Tim Draper? <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't want to mention his name, but yes. <laughs> okay. So this is the former CEO of PayPal coming out and saying this. Now, you have to understand, he represents the old guard. He represents everything that's wrong with the global economy, where he's a crony capitalist. And Bitcoin and various other cryptocurrencies are threats to the legacy financial system. We are watching the greatest levels of income inequality in modern history. The top 1%, they're making money on the way up and on the way down. The Fed is printing trillions upon trillions of dollars to prop up this system. Yet he's calling Bitcoin a scam. See, at a certain point, you have to be able to look and see things for what they truly are. He represents everything that's wrong with the system, where behind the scenes, they're doing one thing, but telling you, oh, don't participate in that. That's a scam. So then now we here we are. If you fast forward two years later, PayPal, Venmo to roll out crypto buying and selling. <laughs> Fintech giant PayPal plans to roll out direct sales of cryptocurrency to its 325 million users, according to three people familiar with the matter. Currently, PayPal can be used as an alternative means for withdrawing funds from exchanges such as Coinbase, but this would be the first in terms of offering direct sales of crypto. Now, you constantly hear people talk about scams, and you constantly hear people asking the question, well, what's Bitcoin's use case? What can it really be used for? The very first thing it could be used for is transparency and accounting and real time accounting. And I've, I just find it odd that like this guy, he's smart, he's brilliant. So he understands what he's doing. He's doing a bait and switch. But let's look at a, a scam that actually happened in real time, in real life through the legacy financial system. It says wire card says missing two point one billion dollars likely do not exist withdraws results so here's a company that's basically saying they don't know where 2.1 billion dollars is at they don't even know if the 2.1 billion dollars even existed this is fraud this is the type of fraud that only can happen in the legacy financial system where you're colluding with banks behind the scenes where 2.1 billion, $2 billion dollars may have existed may not have existed but because of accounting or lack thereof, or because you have to trust in people and not trust in math and systems, this can happen. See, when you remove the middleman, right, and you trust in math and you trust in code and you trust in proof of work and you trust in cryptography, you can verify that these transactions actually happened. So when you go to the Bitcoin Block Explorer, and I'm going to do that and show you that in a second, I can verify that 
Alice actually has two Bitcoin in her wallet. Now, I may not know it's Alice because there's a level of anonymity with an address. It's synonymous. But I know that that address, based upon the hash functions, based upon the UTXOs, based upon cryptography, has the ability to spend that Bitcoin and send it to me. Right, So I don't have to sit up here and go through a third party and fill out a form and wait till the bank opens. No. Peer to peer, that money can be sent to me anywhere in the world as long as I have an Internet connection and I have a Bitcoin wallet. So let's read this article real quick so you can see the levels of fraud that exists in the legacy financial system. Right here it says Wirecard AG on Monday said there was a likelihood that 1.9 billion euros reported missing from its accounts simply did not exist in the first place. The scandal hit German payments firm said it was also withdrawing its full 2019 and 2020 financial results. The management board of Wirecard assesses on the basis of further examination that there is a prevailing likelihood that the bank trust account balances in the amount of 1.9 billion euros do not exist. Think about that. How are you a company and you're saying, well, the money didn't even exist in the first place. <laughs> it says chief executive officer Marcus Braun quit on Friday as the company's search for 2.1 billion of missing cash hit a dead end in the Philippines in as it scrambled to secure a financial lifeline from its banks. The Central Bank of Philippines said on Sunday that none of the $2.1 billion missing from Wirecard appeared to have entered the Philippine financial system. The auditor was unable to confirm the existence of that amount in the cash balances on trust accounts representing about a quarter of Wirecard's balance sheet, the payment company said on Thursday. Only This can only happen in the traditional banking system where money just disappears. No one knows where it went. Now, for those of us who are three-dimensional thinkers, we know where the money went. It went into, this money was laundered, and this money probably went into these executives and CEOs' pockets, allegedly. Right, but they don't, see, what, what kills me is that they don't see this as a scam. They don't see how an accounting company, accounting firm, can literally just lose $2.1 billion. That's not a scam, right? To print money out of thin air, to bail out financial institutions, that's not a scam, right? But somehow having an open in a public ledger where I can view everything that's happening, mm, no, that's a scam. And what, what do I mean by that? See, with Bitcoin and various other cryptocurrencies, you can pull up the block, you can go to blockchain.com and you can pull up a block explorer. And you can see every single transaction that has happened in that block. So I don't have to guess. And I can go back in history. I can go as far back to the as far back as the Genesis block, the very first block. And I can see all of the transactions that have happened in that block. So I can come here and I can click on block height. OK, this block was just mined three minutes ago. And I can see on this block. Let's refresh this because this page was sitting here still. Let's refresh this. So this block right here was mined 23 minutes ago. We click on the block height. Right here, I can see the hash, right? So I understand that now this block has a unique digital fingerprint. If anything inside of this block is changed in the future, it will completely change the hash of this block. This is what people say when they say it's immutable. Because if you change anything, you, ch you change the unique fingerprint of that block, therefore breaking the link of all of the blocks that come after it. So we can verify that we know there's a certain amount of computation, new effort and energy that went into this. You had to mine this block and you had to solve this block. And I go into this type of stuff and I explain this to you inside of the Bitcoin course for those of you who don't know, which is why I tell you that it's important to educate yourself on cryptography so you can understand I don't have to trust in an accounting firm, I can verify this through the block explorer. I can verify this with math that, okay, this block is a legitimate block. I can then come down here and I can see all of the transactions. So I know the time of the block, right? It happened on 
the 24th, right, 6, 2020 20 at 2120. I know the height of the block, right? I can then see the difficulty of the network. I can see the bits in there. I can see the weight, the size, the nonce, the transaction volume. And then I can see every single address in their transactions inside of this block. All of the transactions and how much Bitcoin was exchanged. I can see which address it was sent to. So when people say, well, what's the use case? This is the use case right here. Just being able to verify payments that actually happened and understand that you can't go back in history and change this. You can't go back and edit this or, or tamper with this and commit fraud. Every single transaction in this block can be verified. Now, I know some of you may be saying, okay, well, that's just one instance. You know, you're cherry picking. Well, let's look at the Pentagon. It says the Pentagon. Now, the Pentagon has a history of magically losing money. Or they, back in the day, some of you may notice that they were spending $100,000 on bathroom, uh, on toilets. They spent $100,000 on each toilet allegedly and supposedly it says the pentagon racks up 35 trillion in accounting changes in one year and now when i read this article you're going to say to yourself this is silly but on this only this type of fraud can happen when you're dealing with crony capitalists and you're dealing with government that's inefficient and you're dealing with the legacy financial system and companies who there there's conflict there are conflicts of interest with a lot of these accounting firms and a lot of these financial institutions. It says money is double or triple counted as it moves between accounts. Imagine you can do that in your bank account. Imagine if you can shift money from one account to the other account and account it as double. Like really think about that, right? And then they always tell you, you know, just pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, work a little bit harder, but then you see this type of stuff and this type of fraud happening where they're literally, this is fraud. And they purposely make the financial system so complex so that you don't understand it. It's very easy. This is fraud. No if, ins, and buts between it. It says the Pentagon made $35 trillion in accounting adjustments last year alone, a total that's larger than the entire U.S. economy and underscores the defenses, the Defense Department's continuing difficulty in balancing its books. The latest estimate is up from 30.7 trillion in 2018 and 29 trillion in 2017. The first year adjustments were tracked in a concerted way, according to Pentagon figures in a lawmaker who who's pursued the accounting morass. Within that 30 trillion is a lot of double, triple, and quadruple counting of the same money as it moved between accounts, said Todd Harrison a Pentagon budget expert with the Center for Strategic and Inter International Studies. The Defense Department acknowledged that it failed its first ever audit in 2018 and then again last year when it reviewed $2.7 trillion in assets and $2.6 trillion in liabilities while auditors found no evidence of fraud. Right now, who do you think is auditing these people? Probably people who have connection to them. Or it's probably like an internal audit now for those of you who may not be technically inclined and understand what i'm saying um if you go back to the movie friday right there was a scene when a big worm came to collect money from Smokey, right and remember he's standing in front of the ice cream truck and, and he's counting he's counting uh big worms money and he's like one two and then he flipped the money over and then he go three four that's what the pentagon was basically doing like every time they would flip the money over, they, they count it as double. Like if you and I could do that, we would be trillionaires, right? So they move the money from one account to the next account. So when the dollar moves from this account to the next account, now it's $2. And then when they transfer it to the next account, it's $4, right? And then they count it as a liability and then they count it as an asset, right? So which one is it, right? Just basically running straight up game. This is straight game. And every time the money shifts, like, there was a story where they were talking about how um, they were over in uh, 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 in the Middle East and like they had pallets of money. And every time they would shift the pallet of money, the pallet of money would get smaller. Like only only government can get away with this type of fraud or financial institutions. And they tell you the best way to rob a bank 
it, the best way to rob a bank is to own one. That's the best way. And this is exactly what they were doing in the Pentagon. It says, uh -huh, right here, it says sloppy record keeping. The combined errors, shorthand, and sloppy record keeping by the DOD accountants do add up to a number nearly 1.5 times the size of the U.S. economy, says Spear, a California Democrat. The report shows the Pentagon employs accounting adjustments like a contractor paints over mold. Their priority is making the situation look manageable, not solving the underlying problem. And I encourage you to go out here and read the entire article. I'm not going to sit up here and read the, the entire article to you. But this is the level of fraud that you see in the financial system, right? Or you see in government. So when people say, well, what's the use case of Bitcoin? What's the use case of Ethereum? What's the use case of crypto? You can verify transactions. I don't have to guess. I don't have to, you know, oh, well, maybe you had the money or maybe it doubled when you transferred it to the next account. No, it doesn't happen that way. Um, now, right here, this goes back to how I constantly keep stressing, get involved in tech because there will be a tidal wave of new jobs and opportunities coming as this system collapses. It's something uh, known as you will get order out of chaos. So I constantly stress to you that don't be a doom and gloom. The world's going to end. There will be opportunity along the way that will present itself. It will be the best of times for some, and it will be the worst of times for others. So now because PayPal is now launching this, a trading platform for cryptocurrencies, it says PayPal's newly formed blockchain research group is hiring. I've been screaming at the top of my lungs on this channel, get involved in tech because with this whole pandemic thing and people working from home, you're going to have to have tech skills in order to get these new jobs that are going to come down the pipe, down the pipeline. It says PayPal has set up a blockchain research group in order to investigate the advantages and disadvantages of blockchain technologies and their applicability to PayPal. It is currently hiring a senior blockchain research engineer. The vacancy is based on pay the vacancy is based at PayPal's headquarters in San Jose, California, and would involve helping the company determine the worth of crypto. Right? Think about this. Go out here Get involved in tech. Learn some basic coding and programming skills. As I said before, for those of you who are part of the Lifetime membership, you know that we're having a coding boot camp coming up starting on the 12th of July. I We, we just did our, our first Q&A on Saturday, and I was diving into the links in our article about how blockchain technology, there are so many corporations and Fortune 500 companies looking for people who have these type of skills. Yes. It may take you six months to a year to really get to the point where you have a firm understanding, but it's not even just in the coding. Like think about the legal aspect of PayPal setting up this type of um, apparatus. A lot, there's going to be a lot of legal work that's going to come from blockchain technology. There will be a lot of marketing. If you're into marketing, and advertising, helping companies set up market marketing and advertising and branding around their, these different crypto projects. There will be so much wealth that is going to be transferred from these legacy industries to this new industry because like like um, Tim Draper stated, this is going to be bigger than the industrial revolution. I promise you, the Bitcoin industry, I mean the blockchain industry, crypto in general, it's less than $300 billion. Right. The entire market cap is 268 billion. This is tiny. The legacy financial institutions, the system, the stock markets worth almost 90 trillion dollars, probably more because we're, we're today was a down day. But in general, we're near the uh, all time highs. It's a 90 trillion dollar market. There's so much wealth and money that's going to leave these legacy institutions and come over here. And we're already seeing the intellectual capital come. We're seeing the big hedge funds and the financial institutions get involved, get the skills necessary because when you're thinking about a career or you're thinking about as an entrepreneur, do you want to get into something that's dying or do you want to get into something that's growing and thriving? 
where you can really say to yourself, I can have a five or 10 year career at this, especially for those of you who are younger. So just like I said, don't even look at it, not even just from the tech standpoint, but from the legal standpoint, from the marketing standpoint, there will be so many opportunities. Just figure out a way to get yourself in to this space because I stress it. I stress this upon to you time and time again. And when you look at the economy, you have to begin to ask yourself and I, I ask yourself this simple question. And I've been breaking this down on this channel for the past, what, four or five months now. Things are going to get worse as far as the economy is concerned because people aren't working, which is going to cause the Fed to have to keep printing trillions upon trillions of dollars. And as of right now, the crypto market is heavily correlated to the stock market and Wall Street is addicted to cheap money like a drug addict is addicted to drugs. And right now, this just hit the news wire. U.S. home mortgage delinquencies reached the highest level since 2011. And I did a video last week where I referred to this as the great disconnect, where Main Street is so disconnected from Wall Street, where you're seeing delinquencies reach the highest level since 2011. But the stock market, especially the Nasdaq, is was hitting all time highs last week. And it says right here. U.S. home mortgage delinquencies climbed in May to the highest level since 2011 as the pandemic's toll on personal finances deepened. The number of the number of borrowers more than 30 days late swelled to 4.3 million, up 723,000 from the previous month. So people more than 30 days late, that number <laughs> swelled to 4.3 million people who can't pay their mortgage right now. So if you're thinking ahead, what does that mean? More stimulus, more money printing, more devaluing the dollar. We know that. We know that the dollar has lost 90% of its purchasing power. So knowing that the Fed's going to have to keep, that's the only way that you can stop this deflationary spiral is you're going to have to print your way out of this. There's no other, you're not growing your way out of this. And we're already seeing Texas, Florida, seeing a spike in COVID cases. Other states that were planning on opening up, they're saying to themselves, you know what? We're going to pause the opening, uh, opening up the economy. And they were only planning on opening up to 25%, 50% capacity anyway. So we understand that we're going to be living with this for the foreseeable future. And even if we get some type of a therapeutic or some type of vaccine, the, now the next question is, can we produce enough of it fast enough? Will it prevent you from getting sick again? Meaning that if I take the vaccine today, how long will it allow me to be immune from it? Or could, this, I, could I still catch it? What will be the side effects? There will be so many things that have to play out. So we're looking at another year to a year and a half, in my opinion, with this. And so many people were expecting a second wave and we're starting to see that. It also says right here, about 20.5 million Americans filed continuing claims for unemployment benefits in the first week of June, the Labor De uh, Department figures show. The del delinquency count includes homeowners who miss payments as part of forbearance agreements, which allows an initial six-month reprieve without penalty. Many of those borrowers initially made payments despite qualifying for the relief plans, a share that has dismissed as the crisis lingers. Only 15% of homeowners in forbearance made payments as of June 15th. <laughs> uh, 15th. So we understand that this is definitely going to be uh, a lingering problem. Can you drop the link to this, please? No problem uh, right here. Copy. Paste. Another thing I've been telling you guys about bankruptcies, you're going to see record numbers of bankruptcies. Why? Because going back to the legacy financial system, our entire economy was based upon is based upon fractional reserve lending It's based around based on leverage. And so many of these companies that were, quote unquote, doing so well, it was all financial engineering. It was all accounting gimmicks and accounting tricks. Going back to this article with the Pentagon, all of this stuff is about, you know, gaming and gimmick gaming system, buying back your stock, juicing the earnings, creating artificial demand. 
That's what Keynesian economics is all about. And now here we have GNC is closing 248 stores after filing bankruptcy. Here's the full list. And you're going to see so many of these companies start to file bankruptcies. What is that going to do to the labor market? What is that going to do to jobs? It's going to cause a what? A contraction, which is what I was telling you. You're going to have, it's like a pendulum. It's going to be the best of times for some, and it's going to be the worst of times for others. And throughout this storm, there will be opportunity. You have to start asking yourself, where will the new opportunities be? Right? Where will these new opportunities be? When you start thinking and asking yourself that question, you'll be able to see through this because so many people are thinking that the economy is going to come back. And even if we get this stimulus and all that, we see the stimulus money is really going to those who don't really need it. Right? They made you wait 12 weeks, uh, what, six weeks to get $1,200. So out of that $6.6 .6 trillion that was printed, I believe around 400 billion or 500 billion went to Main Street. The rest of it went to businesses, predominantly Wall Street. And why do you think the stock market's right back at all-time highs? And I told you I did a video where I explained to you retail, the retail industry. Amazon, Target, Walmart, those type of companies are going to thrive in this environment and they're going to gobble up and basically make most of these little small stores like GNC obsolete. And that's just the reality. Again, that's a contracting that's taking away jobs. So you have technology taking jobs. You have low skilled workers in other countries willing to do certain jobs for cheaper. Right. And then now you have so many companies stuck with debt that they're having to file bankruptcy. And then you have Amazon just putting pressure on so many people's margins because they, they, they have dick. Amazon can scale and sell at scale. And they don't have that overhead like a Macy's, like a Sears, or like a GNC. So understanding the digital economy is extremely important. Underst so if you understand the digital economy, now you start understanding digital currencies and why it's important. Because as Jack Dorsey stated before, there is no native currency for the Internet. And that's what Bitcoin or Ethereum may become. So from an investment standpoint, there's so much opportunity, especially in DeFi. And then from a, uh, you know, like I said, an employment opportunity, we see blockchain is on fire. And I want to pull up the article for you guys. I shared this inside of uh, the academy. Give me one second. Just so you can understand that I'm not, you know, just sitting up here um, telling you this. Right here, it says these are the most in demand skills, job skills in 2020, according to LinkedIn. It says blockchain has topped the list of skills bosses are looking for in employees around the world this year. According to professional social media platform LinkedIn, the record keeping technology first emerged in 2009 with the birth of cryptocurrency but has since moved on from supporting the use of likes of Bitcoin. The ability to store, validate, authorize, and move data across the internet with blockchain means it is now being used to securely store and send any digital asset. The technology also stores a permanent and non-editable record, uh, record of data entry. And this goes back to here, missing $2.1 billion. Understand that with proof of work, with cryptography, with hash functions, the blockchain, this can happen with proper record keeping. So when people say, what is the use case of Bitcoin? Being able to verify transactions without having to trust. We, that's the saying in the community. Don't trust verify. I don't have to trust some accounting firm or agency that may have ties to the same bank or institution that they're auditing. Again, as I said earlier, I can pull up the block explorer. I can verify, does this address have the Bitcoin or did this address have the Bitcoin? 
okay, this address had the Bitcoin. They had the UTXOs. Okay, I can follow the inputs and the outputs from that address to the next address. It's funny you said that, uh, Maya Moto Jones, because I was speaking about the Pentagon missing trillions. I actually, you must think I um, got here late, but I just shared this article here about the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon racks up $35 trillion in accounting changes in one year. This is recent, too. This is, this is in uh, January 22nd, 2020. So the Pentagon has been playing this game. The best, most of these Fortune 500 companies, you see they're crony capitalists. They go to the government, they get all these bailouts, all of these different tax breaks, and then magically, you know, different things happen to the money, right? There's so many losses because these accounting firms, right? These institutions have the accounting firms in their pocket, right? So... As I said before, just think of it. For, for those of you who may not be that technically inclined, they do this to try to trick you. Just go to the movie Friday when Smokey was with Big with Big Worm, and he was counting the money in front of the ice cream truck, and he said, "This is one hundred, this is two hundred, and then he flipped the same two hundred over, and it says three hundred is four hundred. That's what the Pentagon was doing. Over here, they counted as an asset. Over there, they counted as a liability. Magically, when the money goes to the next account, it doubles. <laughs> <laughs> right so it, it it happens time and time again and it will continue to keep happening and this is why i keep trying to tell and i'm gonna share the article with you guys so that you can go and like i said before don't don't believe anything that i say uh all, always think that i don't know what i'm uh, that i have no clue what i'm talking about and go behind me and research this stuff and you will begin to see that there are there are some serious problems with our financial system and if right now, if you're not watching this and you're not seeing that this CEO, and I'll play the video for you again, he's over here saying that Bitcoin is a scam, crypto is a scam, but then the same company that he was the CEO of is now launching a trading platform. And we watched JP Morgan do the same exact thing. So give me one second. Let me just, I'm gonna, cause some, I know some of you are coming a little late, so I'll play the video again for you. But our next guest says that uh, it is a scam. In an op-ed for Recode this week, former PayPal CEO Bill Harris called the cryptocurrency, quote, the greatest scam in history, noting that it is a pump and dump scheme unlike anything the world has ever seen. How does he really feel? Bill Harris joins us now from San Francisco to stand by these claims. Bill, great to have you with us. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, you know, reading through this op-ed, it's sort of the, the bear case, the critics case that has been put forth for a long time. It's a, not accepted as a means of payment. There's no store value because of the volatility in price. It has no intrinsic value. Is it possible, though, Bill, that perhaps Bitcoin has not yet found its use as a cryptocurrency yet, and that we're looking at the United States where there are numerous ways of digital payment and, and the use of dollars is is reliable and good, and we're not looking at other markets that need an alternative currency such as the emerging markets. Well, sure, but even in emerging markets, um, might as well use dollars, euros, or existing currencies um, if the local currency. And notice, notice that he said you can use, if you're having inflation, right? If you're having inflation in your local currency, you can use the dollar or you or euros they do this on purpose because they want to give artificial demand to the u.s dollar and this is what i was talking about when i said to you the u.s exports our inflation see we can export our inflation because we are the reserve currency so there's artificial demand because we can get all of these other countries in debt and then force them to have to convert their currencies into dollars so that gives them an artificial demand for the u.s dollar when you think about commodities they have to be their local currency has to be converted into dollars to buy commodities so when you understand how the government the u.s government manipulates the currency markets all fiat currencies eventually return to their original value which is zero and he represents that legacy financial system. And then as someone just uh, put in the chat, says the art of war 101, all war is based on deception. Tell you it's a scam. Tell you it's a scheme. 
while they behind the scenes buy it up. And then now they turn around after they corner the market and they come to you and they say, oh, hey, PayPal and Venmo, they're going to roll out a platform to buy and sell cryptocurrencies. Every time Bitcoin crashes, I buy more. Every time Ethereum crashes, I buy more because I understand problem, reaction, solution. Create the problem, wait for people to react, and then you magically come with the solution. If you fund both sides of the war, eventually you still win. It's a scam. It's a scheme. It's rat poison. And oh, now all of a sudden, the government's talking about a digital, a digital coin. Right now, now they're talking about a digital dollar. And I would not be surprised if in the future, the same way that you see how the government buys gold and they're buying mortgage-backed securities, I would, not be, I would not be surprised that in the near future, if you don't see them starting to buy cryptocurrencies. Think about it. This seriously. You have the Fed out here buying junk bonds. You have the Fed out here buying ETFs. You have the Fed literally buying stocks. They're go, like literally they're, they're, they're buying companies debt. They're buying mortgage backed securities. Is it that far fetched to believe that they won't start buying cryptocurrencies? Is that far fetched? They're already buying junk debt. Think like listen to the listen to the term that I'm using right now. The Federal Reserve is buying junk debt. Basically, that's telling you that these companies they have a high a high probability of default. I would not be surprised if they didn't start buying cryptocurrencies or other central banks throughout the world. Now, you can get into the whole go down that conspiracy route or, or route where you're saying this is corporatizing crypto. It is that this may be the way that they can destroy crypto or control crypto. It is. But I want you to think about the gains that you can make. Right. So if you're in this from an investment standpoint, see, this is why you, you have to you have to wear multiple hats. Right. If you're a person who you don't care about the technology, right? let's say that you don't care about the tech. You don't care about the powers that be controlling the world. You don't care about a one world currency. You just want to make gains, right? Understanding that they have the printing press, understanding that this is a $267 billion market, the entire market. What do you think the prices of these cryptocurrencies are going to be when the market cap is $2 trillion, $3 trillion, $4 trillion? So even if you don't care about the technology, even if you don't care about working in this space, just think about the prices of your, your favorite cryptocurrency when central banks start buying it. When the bankers get involved in a major way, because you know they're already getting involved behind the scenes. But once, once this market starts pumping, remember, I've been in this market going back to, what, 2012, 2013. When this crypto market starts pumping, it's going to pump. So even if you don't care about the decentralization, if you don't care, about, just from an investment standpoint, you're looking at an opportunity of a lifetime. I should be reconnected right now. I went out for a second. Yeah, I, I was saying before um, my Internet went down for a second. I said, what do you think the price of Cardano is going to be at a $200 billion market cap, which is tiny? Think about it. Apple and Google and Amazon, they're trillion dollar companies trillion dollar companies we're talking about crypto being the internet 2.0 this is going to be bigger than the industrial revolution what do you think a price of an eight cents cryptocurrencies or if eight cents right now at two billion dollars what do you think this could be worth if it's at 200 billion what do you what do you what do you think what, what do you know what do you think tezos is going to be right what do you what do you think it's going to be what do you think Chainlink is going to be? Monero, Tron, Neo, Ethereum Classic. We, we, we see the adoption coming. We see Wall Street getting in. All of the people who said it was a scam. Are you going to wait? Because I have to understand an investment. 
You don't buy Tesla once they've uh, manufactured the battery and the car can travel, you know, a thousand miles on one charge. At that point, it's too late. You buy something when it has the problems, but you see the vision as to where it can go. You don't wait until they already accomplished what they're trying to accomplish because then the investment opportunity isn't there anymore. You buy something that has a problem, but you're, bu you're investing in the idea of a team. Can the team accomplish this? When you look at ETH, and you look at Ethereum, and you look at DeFi, and you look at all of these different protocols that are trying to participate in the DeFi space, ask yourself a simple question. Do you believe that they can capture that value? Can they solve those problems? Satoshi solved the double spending problem of proof of work. And now you have people building on top of Satoshi's legacy. Where will we go? So I hope that you begin, begin to see that this, the opportunity that we have here. And again, this is not even me shilling my product, even though I think I have a good product, but understanding that this will give you for $50 per month and you don't have to stay forever. You can get access to some high level information, teach you how to buy, how to sell, how to store your crypto. Right now we have one course in here about Bitcoin. I'm getting ready to launch the second part of the Bitcoin course. In the coming weeks, we're going to have a course on Ethereum. We're also going to have a coding bootcamp starting out with Java and then also going into Solidity, teaching you the basics and the fundamentals on how to develop and deploy smart contracts on the Ethereum uh, blockchain, utilizing the programming language Solidity. Again, these are things that we're building upon. We currently only have five slots left for the lifetime membership. Uh, with $50 per month, we're only focused, the $50 per month gets you the introductory level courses. The lifetime membership gets you access to every single course that will ever ever be launched inside of the academy and then we're only limiting that to 20 students like i said right now we're up to 15 people that are in the lifetime membership that will be a part of the coding boot camp that we are launching on july 12th and um we're cutting that off at 20 students there's only five slots left so i've been getting a lot of positive feedback and that's why i rolled out this course the way that i did because i understand that a lot of you uh most people they don't have this you know, they don't have the uh, technical knowledge to understand this stuff. And many of the people in the crypto space, they, they just they aren't good communicators. They, they, they talk above you rather than talking to you where you currently are and kind of onboarding you. So what I focus on doing is giving you that those basics and then this way at an affordable price and then pushing you towards the more advanced stuff. Because some of you, you may get involved in this space. Like, think about it. If I spend... $3,500 for a course and I felt like it's too technical, I'm going to be pissed off. But if I spend $50 and I go through some stuff and I go, whoa, this is a little bit too much for me, I only spend $50. Excuse me. So I, I wanted to structure something that would be affordable for most people um, and that would make sense for me economically, financially, from a business standpoint. And then now, if you want to take it further, you can. And if you don't, you leave it. But at least you'll know how to buy, you'll know how to sell, and you know how to store your crypto from an investment standpoint. So a link to join my tech academy will be in the description below. Um, and Courtney Gibson, that's a very, very good question. We understand, does PayPal let us keep our private keys? You know they're not going to let you uh, keep your private keys. This is a way for the bankers to co-opt crypto. The same way that Cash App is getting involved with, with um, I believe I believe Cash App is owned by Square with Jack Dorsey and uh, I believe that somehow Square is um, connected to Cash App. Uh, PayPal is trying to do the same thing. This is a way of corporatizing and centralizing crypto. And again, I'm not a fan of centralized exchanges. You know me. I believe in I believe in using decentralized exchanges. I believe in um, not your keys, not your crypto. Uh, having controlling your private keys allows you to be your own bank, allows you to be your own financial institution. Uh, allowing them to come into this space is going to allow them to run the same gimmicks and tricks from before. So I would recommend that, you know me, you deal with decentralized exchanges, but you have to understand, uh, Courtney Gibson, 
Most people aren't technically inclined. Uh, they don't understand how to play with hardware wallets, remembering their seed phrases and pass phrases. It's hard for most people. Um, most of the, many of these words that I'm saying right now, most people don't even know what the hell I'm saying. Uh, and that's okay. So for some people who just want to get involved from an investment standpoint, I understand the need of a Coinbase. I understand the need of a, of a PayPal or a Cash App. And like John Lycos just said, also think about merchants. Um, this, this is the way to get adoption as far as people being able to transact and use Bitcoin to really buy and sell goods and services over the Internet. So this could be a positive in some aspect. Uh, but it, I'm not going to sit up here and lie to you. Like I don't see that this can become problematic when you're allowing so many of the legacy uh, institutions and firms and uh, businesses to get involved from this standpoint. You know, I I really am a, a big fan of decentralizing most most of the economy because centralization really um, centralization breeds corruption. It breeds inefficiencies and it breeds fraud. Uh, depending on a small group of people to manage and control things will always lead to a problem. The best and the best society to live in is a free and open one. And being able to pull up a block explorer and being able to see where these transactions are coming from and who they're going to is extremely important. Uh, and 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 I'm a firm believer in that if we don't get crypto right, this is our last chance to beat the the power brokers, the New World Order, the Illuminati. Or uh, whatever it is that you may believe is the, the entities behind pulling the strings of of the the system. Getting this right is going to to dictate what type of digital economy we live in. Will Aldous Huxley and George Orwell be correct? As of right now, today they they are correct. 1984 is here today. A brave new world is here today, and we have to ask ourselves what type of uh, digital economy do we want to live in? Do we want to live in one where everything is tracked and monitored and stored in databases by Fortune 500 companies? Or do we want something where we have a level of control as to how much of our privacy do we want to give to these companies? And I think that that's going to be the fight and the battle of the the next 10 to 15 years. How much privacy do... Like, why does Nike need to get all of your personal information and then store that information. What are they holding your personal information for? You know, Nike does not need to be holding all of that information, cookieing you and tracking you and following all of the websites that you visit, monitoring your social media platform. So many, so many different ways that these companies are really monitoring you. And I'm going to leave this video with this before I take some questions. When you really dive down that rabbit hole of privacy and you start understanding that these companies know so much about you and they're storing so much about you, you will really start to get scared about the fact that like they know so much information about you. Like literally when they cookie you, you see, do I accept those cookies? They are following you throughout the Internet. Every website that you're visiting and logging into, these companies are mining that data. And that's just the nice version of it. You don't really know the deeper, how deep that rabbit hole goes. So your privacy is extremely important and you should start to value it. And this is what the fight will be for the, uh, the, the forecoming, the upcoming uh, future. <laughs> uh, so let's take some questions. Let's see what's going here. Self-made SM. And please guys like the video and share the video and subscribe. It helps the, uh, the content get out there. Oh, he said, yeah, Square uh, bought out Cash App a little while ago. Okay. It says that All Not Bank doesn't let you own the BTC they have. You can only use it in their ecosystem. They're approved merchants. I figured that. Something something like that. It. I look at probably the... The PayPal version probably being similar to what you see in uh, Robinhood, where they allow you to like trade the underlying asset. Um, but the fact that PayPal probably wants to compete with 
Cash App. I can also see them allowing you to take a Bitcoin off of Cash App. Like in, in my tech academy, I have a video where I show you how you can buy it on Cash App and then transfer it over to uh, your um, hardware wallet. For those of you who uh, didn't make it through that, that far throughout um, the academy, there's a video teaching you that. Because decentralized exchanges aren't that easy to use. Um, they're not user friendly. You have to have a level of, um, you know, tech know-how. Uh, Zulu Immortal says, Eli, if they start buying crypto, don't they have enough cash to manipulate the market? Of course they do. Um, you you should expect, and I, I Andreas has a good video about this. If you think that you're going to dethrone the dollar, if you think that you are going to um, go to war, that's like saying I'm going to go into a fight and I'm going to punch a person and not expect them to punch back. Um, look at what they did to Gaddafi with Libya when he was trying to go to a gold standard. They they did the same thing recently to um, Iraq when they were when um, the U Iraq wanted the U.S. to leave and they threatened to uh, hold their money that's sitting at the Fed from the oil reserves. Like the, the U.S. government always plays dirty, and I expect them to play dirty. I expect them to try to co-opt and um, attack the system. But Bitcoin has been ticking now for eleven years successfully. Um, and I believe that Bitcoin is uh, every year in every block that is solved on the Bitcoin network makes Bitcoin a little bit stronger. And Bitcoin has survived Mt. Gox. It survived the Silk Road. Uh, it survived India, China, abandoned it time and time again. And I believe throughout this that the more we educate people and the more we onboard people to the importance of cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, that uh, it, it'll get stronger. And I really believe that. I believe that this is resilient. And I believe that more and more people are going to start to see the value of this. Because remember, I did the video the other day talking about the Zabellion. Millennials and younger are not really playing the stock market as far as like long-term investments. So many of us, we see the fraud, we see the deception, we see the lies. So we, we, many of us are playing in crypto and, and, and we'll, we'll like, so these legacy companies, they want to try to get a piece of it or try to control it. Um, if you are a regular, if you are a regular, um, monthly member, you're, you're paid $50 every month as a monthly member. As a lifetime member, you don't have to pay the $50. The $50 is waived. You get lifetime access. You don't have to, any premium level courses that we offer in the future, you don't have to pay for them. Uh, the monthly membership, you don't have to pay that either. So it's a fairly sweet deal. And we're only cutting this off to 20 people because remember I said, this is a business you're running and operating. And remember, for me to learn this stuff, for me to have the microphones, the green screens, the webcams, uh, like I'm getting ready to go to um, Raul's live. He has a live event coming up in five days. I registered for that. The different news sources that I pay for, like all of this stuff costs money, right? Like you, you can't learn. This is not something that you can really learn about in a, in an efficient way for free. Yes, there, there's free sources, but it's scattered and it's all over the place. And trust me when I tell you, there's always some backdoor way that they're trying to monetize you and from my experience many of the sources that are free they just don't do a good job of really onboarding non-technical people right so that's why i look at it from the standpoint of trying to onboard people who really don't understand what the hell a hash function is what is public key cryptography how long has it been around for so i just feel like i do a good job of explaining that and i wanted to first test this that's why i rolled it out the way that i did in a slow fashion, and I wouldn't say slow because we just launched it like, what, a week and a half ago, but just to see if there's true demand. Okay, well, there's demand now. So then now we can start ramping up and, and working our way up. But remember, the lifetime membership isn't for everyone. I'm not going to sit up here and try to sell you something that may not be for you. If you're not a person that has a growth mindset, if you're not a person that's a problem solver, if you're not a person that's not really that technically inclined, if you don't really understand like how to use an email address and stuff like that, then, you know, it may not be for you. Um, but if you are a person who you have a growth mindset, 
and you're saying to yourself, you know, I want to get started now and in the next year to year and a half, two years, develop the skill set that I need to get involved in this industry, then there we go. Because the bull market's coming. Uh, John Lycos, I, I spoke about that um, inside of my tech academy about the quantum computers. Um, you have to understand that so many people don't understand that Bitcoin is made up of a multiple of technologies. It's not just hash functions that make up the Bitcoin network. You also have public key cryptography. You also have digital signatures. And Satoshi was able to take all of this existing technology and blend it together in a way to create Bitcoin where each piece of Bitcoin leans on the other or of a blockchain. So the same way how MD5 was eventually broken, I believe eventually SHA-256 will be broken. But what a lot of people don't understand is that if you have a quantum computer, you don't use it on Bitcoin. There are so many other more important things that you can use a quantum computer on. Because remember, once you use that quantum computer, everyone knows you have it, right? Like think about it. That's like saying I have a gun. Once you pull a gun out, everyone knows you have the gun now. So you may be able to shoot one or two or three people, but then someone's eventually going to shoot you, right? Because they know you have a gun now. So whenever someone decides to pull out that quantum computer and use it, they're going to let the world know, wait, this is a quantum computer. And then guess what's going to happen? People are going to create quantum resistant hashing algorithms. The same way like when, SHA, when uh, MD5 was broken, they created SHA-1. And then SHA-1 eventually was broken. Then they created SHA-2, 256. And you, that will keep happening. That's how technology e evolves over time. So yes, I believe within the next five or 10 years, there will be a quantum computer. The question needs to be, will we have quantum resisting hashing algorithms? And the same way you can create a quantum computer, you can create quantum resisting hashing algorithms. So understand that whenever you see a person talking about like the quantum computer, being able to break Bitcoin, they're doing that because they, they understand that, that that gets headlines and attention. But the same way you can create the quantum computer, you can create quantum resisting hashing algorithms. Because guess what? If you can break SHA-256, then that means the, nu the nuclear codes are not safe. That means no banking institution is not safe, right? If you could break SHA-256 in public key cryptography, any, any place that has a website or that's online is not safe. That quantum computer is breaking everything. And I guarantee you the same way that you have people working on quantum computers, you have people right now working on quantum resistant hashing algorithms. That's just the way tech goes. It's an ebb and flow. So, you know, I don't I don't get caught up on that type of stuff because I understand the technology and I understand the history of hash functions and how hash functions will continuously get broken and new ones will arrive. And that's just the way that things, you know, they operate. But it's not easy to make a quantum computer. It's not efficient to make a quantum computer. Like it takes time. Like people make it like you're just gonna go. Oh, we have a quantum computer. Like they're very inefficient. They're they're, they're very very uh, expensive to make. It's not just a you know overnight one two three thing to make a uh, a quantum computer. And as I said before, the last thing I would be worried about is Bitcoin. If a quantum computer exists in that way, you know uh, that's the last thing I would be worried about is them using it on Bitcoin. Um, here, right? I, I would, I, I would, I, I would be worried about the nuclear codes. I would be worried about your data. I would be worried about communications networks, such as like you know, cell phone data and stuff like that. Because if people can get their hands on a quantum computer, now you know they're going to be able to blackmail governments. They're going to be able to pull up all type of different data and records. The last thing you would worry about is a Bitcoin. There's better ways to attack Bitcoin than using a quantum computers. Like you can just drone strike all the miners. Like it's much more cost efficient. There, are, there are so many uh, more cost efficient ways to attack Bitcoin than using a quantum computer. Like if I wanted to attack Bitcoin, I would just get a heat map of where all the miners are at the big mining pools, and I would just have some drones just go shoot some missiles and blow them up. You know that that I mean that's the, that's one of like the easiest ways to attack Bitcoin. Like just go blow up all the miners. <laughs> like. I mean, you already have the you already have the um the uh, equipment to do it. You have the drones to do it. So just go blow up all the big miners, and uh, just like that, you know, you'll 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 kill so much of the the hash rate of Bitcoin, 
And then other big miners, they will be afraid that they're going to get drone strikes, so they'll turn their mining equipment off. You know, so that's one of the easiest ways to attack Bitcoin, just blow up the miners. And I mean, you, you could literally do that and coordinate that because we already dropped, we already drone strike people already in the Middle East. So why not do it now? Like that's just one of the easiest ways to attack Bitcoin. Um, Courtney Gibson, I'm going to start putting books. Remember, for those of you who are part of the coding boot camp, I'm going to send you out the syllabus in about we're going up about like a week, week and a half. And then um I'm waiting for more people to finish the Bitcoin course because as of today, I believe there's like seven who's finished it now. Because for some of you, you're taking your time as you should. Take your time with information. Don't rush through information. One of the worst things you can do is try to like just rush to complete a course. Um, take your time, watch videos a few times. Cause many of you said to me, like, you know, you were struggling with like the hash functions and the public key stuff, public key cryptography. That's some high level stuff. Like each one of those videos, like there's, there are college courses on public key cryptography. There, there, there's college courses on hashing functions. So to, for me to be able to condense it into a 15 minute video is really just for you to get an understanding of it. Like there's so much more that you can learn about that, but I plan on having a book section and the first book that I'm going to have in there is The Internet of Money. Uh, I found a PDF version of The Internet of Money, and I'm going to have that uh, inside of the Academy. And that's Andreas' book, The Internet of Money. Um, again, it takes years to really become, to have a, be competent in this and really have a, a deep understanding. Remember, I've lost money. I've been burned. Uh, I've chased some pump and dump schemes. So I know a lot about this stuff because... When I first got started, all you could do is just read the Bitcoin uh, talk forum. Like there wasn't a lot of videos and YouTubers and stuff like that. Many of you are lucky now that you have so many different uh, resources that you can go and read. You can go on Medium. You got so many uh, personalities that you can follow. You have Ryan Adams. You have Ivan on Tech. You have Andreas. Uh, you have Jameson Lop. Like there's so many different big names of people that you can follow in the crypto space and they have resources, some of them free, some of them paid, uh, and you can get an understanding as to what's going on. When I got started, there was nothing like literally it was just reading people, re reading people's posts on a forum. Right. So like, you know, I remember back then, like uh, I was messing around with D Walla and so many different things. Um, so trust me, like I said before, the Academy is going to be a living and breathing entity. Because so much is happening and so much is changing. And that's why I tell you guys, find a particular segment or niche in this crypto space and master that. If you're into the cryptography public key aspect of it, if you're into the security aspect of it, if you're into hash functions, if you're into mining, uh, if you're into decentralized exchanges, if you're into DeFi, well, what part of DeFi are you into? Like right here, we can pull up DeFi Prime. Uh, these are all of the different DeFi projects that are going on right now. I plan on, there's going to probably be like a whole hour video just on this alone inside of the Academy where you can see so many different projects in DeFi and you can see them. You have alternate savings, you have decentralized autonomous organizations with DAOs, you have infrastructure, you have lending, you have borrowing, you can get into payments, you can get into staking, you get into analytics, insurance, margin trading, prediction markets tokenization of assets, asset management, derivatives, KYC, identity, marketplaces, stable coins. I mean, literally, there's so many different things that you can get into when it comes to crypto. Find one particular part that you want to dominate and dominate. That's why like sometimes you guys come to me and say, hey, you heard about this? And I say, no, because DeFi alone, every day there's probably like 50 new things happening in DeFi alone. Just on Ethereum. I mean, you have Tornado Cash, you have, uh, you know, different staking platforms. I mean, I just heard of another DeFi platform or Cake. Uh, then you think about Bitcoin. You have side chains with Rootstock. There, there's, there's so you have Taproot. Like there, there's so many things happening in crypto that it's impossible for one person to know. Which guess what? That's opportunity. Master that. Well, go study. What is, what is Rootstock? Go look it up. Go look up Liquid Lightning Network. Go get into different DeFi programs. Uh, go and study Comp, right? Like like Compound. Like really, seriously, go out here and get and get involved. DYDX, Balancer, Quicknode, Mesa, Melanin Terminal, Melon Terminal, uh, Terminal, uh, P Tokens. Like seriously, there's just so much.
Start a podcast. You can start a blog. Start a YouTube channel. There's so many ways that you can make money and get into crypto. The thing is just the thing is, guys, just get in. Get involved. Dive down the rabbit hole and break things along the way. And if you do that, you'll solve all your problems. So I'm going to leave the live stream here. Uh, for those of you who want who are interested in taking a free seven day trial with My Tech Academy, uh, here's the link. And for those of you who come watch this video later, you can um, definitely find the link in the description. Uh, please like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. And if you want to contact me, a link to my Instagram will be in the description below. Have a blessed and beautiful night, and I will see you guys tomorrow.